Welcome to another edition of Senior Moments with a Question Mark. And of course, you all know why there's a question mark. We don't have senior moments. We have intellectual pauses. All right. Uh, today we have a great program. Uh, I've got another doctor on. And um, there isn't anything we're going to talk about today that anybody in the audience has not had. So you may want to get paper and pencil to take some notes, especially you men who don't like doctors anyway. So anyway, my guest today is Dr. Steve Nahard from Leahy and Beth Israel, whatever, in Peabody. Welcome to the program, doctor. Thank you, Bob. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay. The subject is gastro... How do, how do I say it? Gastro... We say GI in the business, to keep it short. GI, okay. It also deals with the throat. So it's the pipe. Okay, dealing from the throat down to the stomach. Okay, a lot of things can go wrong. So, example. Oh, before I get into that, we have to tell some jokes, uh, don't we, Kim? Yes, absolutely. All right, well, the first one is, at this time of year, what do we see? We see a lot of turkeys around. And as a result of that, you know, they're crossing streets, this, that, whatever. In fact, I had a turkey jump up on the top of my convertible, and I thought that was it for the convertible, but did not puncture it. So anyway, Steve, why do turkeys like to cross busy streets? Jeez, Bob. Turkey meat is very good for you, so I think to donate some of their drumsticks to our, our citizens? Not exactly. They, they don't want to be considered chickens. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, boy. <laughs> well, anyway, um, this morning, this guy goes in for minor surgery at, at, at Pebbly Hospital down the street here, and um, all of a sudden... Uh, some things went wrong. So there's good news and bad news here. Uh, by mistake, they cut off his left arm. But the good news is he's all right. Huh. <laughs> now, Steve, I know, I know you have some jokes. Well, you know, my field of gastroenterology is full of, you know, potentially awkward moments, but usually we find a way to get through them with laughter. Uh, laughter is the best medicine, and, and it's So you true. usually don't say that word that begins with S? No, no, we usually just, uh, you know, help make patients comfortable. And sometimes I'll get surprised, and after 20 years I was surprised the other day when a 90-year-old woman was referred to me because of blood in the stool. And I went in to examine her, and she was wrapped up in a sheet, and she wasn't really moving. And I kind of tiptoed up to her to see if she was okay, when all of a sudden she looked at me and said, you must be the rear admiral. Oh, <laughs> good one. All right, enough for the jokes. Let's get serious here. So, we've all had some of these symptoms. And they are, so I don't miss any. Butt in the stool, swallowing issues, abdominal pain, and constipation or diarrhea, and reflex. So get ready to take notes. What do you want to start with? I like your approach. Let's work from the top down. Well, let's start with uh, reflex then. Yeah. So heartburn is extremely common. You know, something like 40 million people have heartburn every day in America. One out of five. Absolutely. And, you know, when is it serious? Well, 
you know, when should you be referred to a gastroenterologist? We define chronic heartburn as somebody who's had heartburn symptoms two or three days a week for over five years. So that's called GERD. G-E-R-D is gastroesophageal reflux disease. Okay. It's not reflex. Reflex are like your elbow and your knee. Right. Reflux is the description of stomach acid coming up into the esophagus and creating a burning sensation, right. uh, sometimes creating a cough, which is usually worse after meals and if you lie down too soon after eating a meal. Okay. So, the good news here is uh, there's quite a bit of stuff that you can take to control on it. This is one of the controllable uh, problems. Absolutely. You know, there is a whole ton of antacids available over the counter um, at your pharmacy. We usually think of them as uh, the topical antacids like Tums, which are great, especially for postmenopausal women, because it's an excellent source of calcium. And postmenopausal women are at risk for osteoporosis, more so than men. And so if you're an older woman with heartburn, taking Tums will help settle your stomach, but it will also give you calcium for your bones. Uh, Pepsid is also a very commonly available medicine, and the best over-the-counter antacid is Prilosec. And the instructions will say, take for two weeks and talk to your doctor. So it's important to let your doctor know if you've had symptoms for over five years, because you may want to see a gastroenterologist to, to have us take a look. When does it usually uh, pop in, 30s, 40s, 50s? Yeah, you know, I've seen patients in their teens hmm. have it and patients in their 70s and 80s. I will say it's a very common problem, but we should be aware of the red flags or the warning signs. Is it acerbated by uh, medical conditions like depression, anxiety, and so forth? It's, it, those problems are in and of themselves are so common. I, I'm not sure that it will make it worse. Is there a hereditary No, component? it's just extremely common. This one is just extremely common. And for most patients, they take antacids and feel better. However, if you have trouble swallowing, that is a red flag, and you should talk to your doctor about that symptom right away. Swallowing. By the way. He's my doctor, and I have a swallowing issue. And I didn't want to take serious medications with side effects. So he comes up with this idea, well, take some peppermint oil. I'm saying to myself, peppermint oil? But anyway, I took peppermint oil, and it worked. It worked. I take it uh, be warm water before my large meals. 100% no, but very, very effective. Um, so anyway, uh, s uh, swallowing issues. Also, um, I like to gear the program to the senior population. So at the end of life, a lot of people, their systems don't communicate with each other. And one of them is swallowing. So uh, swallowing disorders are very common, but we need to take them seriously. Uh, most swallowing disorders are due to spasms of the esophagus. And think of a spasm like a charley horse. You can get cramping, let's say, in your leg. That's a charley horse. The same thing can happen in the esophagus. It can go into spasm, and that's where peppermint oil can help relax the muscles of the esophagus and allow food to pass easier. But usually, we would like an x-ray or an endoscopy for patients with swallowing disorders to rule out a tumor. Tumors of the esophagus, esophageal cancer, is very uncommon, but that's what we're in the business of doing is sorting out swallowing disorders from the very serious to the more common, like what you have. Um, 
Mine got a little serious uh, fairly recently, and you put me on uh, Insure. And that worked real well. And I'm just about off of it completely. Uh, I am tremendously improved from, 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 from when I saw you, which has surprised me, actually. You know, um, it, a lot of our seniors, if they lose any weight, some of their systems, as you said, can become disconnected from one another. And sometimes you just lose the strength to properly swallow, and the Ensure can boost your energy levels so that your swallowing can return to a more functional level. And the, the good part out of it is I actually did end up losing weight, so... Um, Okay, now, um, how about uh, stomach? Yeah, abdominal. It'll probably start off with some abdominal pain. Sure. Now, abdominal pain can come in very many different sizes and shapes. And let's say, uh, you know, if it's upper abdominal pain, um, you know, you worry about the stomach, the gallbladder, and the pancreas. Could be a heart. Well, if it's Upper. radiating to the chest and right. if you have any exertional um, symptoms. Can you, um, you know, pain with exertion, like running to catch a bus, is a cardiac in nature versus after a meal or lying down at rest, most abdominal pain is digestive. So in eating, everything in moderation? Absolutely. And I guess the red flags for abdominal pain is if it persists for 24 or 48 hours steady. Mm. Anything that is a steady pain is a concern, especially if it's associated with a fever. Uh, that could represent infection of the gallbladder uh, or the pancreas or lower down diverticulitis is very common in our seniors. That would be a pain typically in the left lower abdomen. And again, it's persisting pain. Gallbladder. Gallbladder is in the right upper abdomen or in the pit of the stomach. Anything that kind of lasts for a persistent amount of time versus a pain that comes and goes in relatively short bursts. Um, we worry about the more uh, persistent pain more, especially if it's associated with fever. All right, what are some of the things that can happen if somebody procrastinates and you know, uh, just won't go, go to the doctor. Well, you can turn a potentially simple infection into a more complicated infection. For example, with diverticulitis, which is an infection of the colon, um, initially, if detected, patients can get better with antibiotics and following a light diet for a couple of days. But if you procrastinate or, or put off evaluation, you can have a complication of diverticulitis, which includes an abscess or perforation, both of which require more invasive medical care, hospitalization, and the risk that something, you know, doesn't go right. So it's important to seek care sooner rather than later um, especially if it's persisting, especially if you have a fever. When do you recommend uh, uh, getting, uh, starting with uh, colonoscopy? So a lot of my practice is doing colonoscopies, mostly for screening purposes and others done for bleeding or persistent diarrhea. So recently, uh, the American College of Oncology decrease the screening age from 50 to 45. So all Americans 45 and older right now are recommended to get screening colonoscopies because colon cancer is the third most common cancer in men and women over 50. Hmm. And it's 100% preventable by doing a colonoscopy early and periodically during your adult years so when you go in there, sometimes everything's okay, and sometimes you see polyps and there's some diverticulosis. That's right. You know, uh, one of the most fascinating things about my field is that in the last 20 years, 
our instruments that we use have have developed so quickly that we can do more and more through endoscopy, whether we're looking through the mouth or up into the colon. We're saving patients uh, from surgery because we can remove things from the colon that... Before it becomes cancerous. Even early cancers can be removed with a scope rather than surgery. Hmm. So that's right. When we do a screen, screening exam, I will meet a patient for the first time many, many, in many cases, and we will go directly to a colonoscopy within five minutes of meeting one another. And at that time, if they have polyps, we can remove them and really help uh, prevent problems later. Uh, we also look for, as you said, diverticulosis. And if we see diverticulosis, we often recommend a high fiber diet. Um, and then we also no do. No peanuts. Well, that's a myth, Bob. Is it? Yep, that's been debunked. Oh. You can have your nuts. And eat them too. Yes, sir. <laughs> Kim liked that one. All right, so. Um, Hepatitis. So hepatitis uh, means inflammation of the liver. Whenever you hear the um, suffix itis, it means inflammation. Whether it be arthritis, gastritis, hepatitis, pancreatitis, diverticulitis, itis just means inflammation. And in this case, hepatitis means inflammation of the liver. And that can be due from a variety of things. Um, most commonly in this country, I would say hepatitis C is a common cause of hepatitis. Hepatitis B, less so. Alcohol, very common a cause. But probably the most common cause of hepatitis right now is due to a fatty liver. We're not very original in gastroenterology. A fatty liver is exactly what it sounds like. When there's too much fat in the liver and fat is irritating and can cause irritation to the liver and the liver cells. And with the obesity epidemic that we're experiencing in this country, fatty liver uh, it causing hepatitis is one of the most common consults that we see. Now, many patients have no symptoms whatsoever, but they have their blood drawn for an insurance physical or as part of an annual physical with their primary care physician, and they're told that their liver enzymes are elevated. They may feel fine, but they are referred to us for further evaluation. And generally what I tell those patients is to lose weight and to exercise regularly because it can cause problems over many years. Fatty liver can cause cirrhosis and cirrhosis is the end product of many different types of hepatitis, but obviously you wanna avoid cirrhosis because it's a risk factor for liver cancer, liver failure and death. Excellent. Okay, uh, ulcers. So ulcers in this country are usually due to too many NSAIDs. Bob, you know what NSAIDs are? No. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. These are very common pain relief medications that are widely used by the public. They include ibuprofen, uh, Aleve, naproxen, naproxen, and even a baby aspirin. I've seen seniors come in with an ulcer from just taking a baby aspirin. And this has been a reason of, uh, a, a focus of study recently that if you uh, have heard, many primary care physicians are not recommending a baby aspirin as a preventative for heart disease, but you should continue it if you've been told by your primary care physician to take it if you've had heart disease. And the reason is even a baby aspirin can cause inflammation in the stomach and ulcers. And ulcers can cause pain, but at least half of ulcers don't cause any pain, they just cause bleeding. 
That bleeding can be anything from just a few drops in the stool every day that you may not be aware of, or it can result in a GI bleed, which turns your stool black. If you have an ulcer that's bleeding in your stomach, your stool will turn black because as it works its way through the digestive tract, it goes from red to black. Right. Um, until recently, because most outpatient uh, people going in, it's, it's drug related. But before that, the number one reason people ended up going to the hospital was because of overdosing on acetaminophen and ibuprofen. And the antidote for that is L acetylcysteine. That's correct. You know, I, it's funny you should mention that. I was looking at our bottle of acetaminophen today in our cabinet, and it's this big. <laughs> and the caplets are 500 milligrams. You cannot take more than four. four. Yeah. You know, 4,000 milligrams per day, which is which would be eight tablets. But if you have liver disease, you can only take half of that. And you can't have alcohol when taking that uh, medicine, Tylenol, or medicines that contain Tylenol in it, like Percocet, for example. So uh, in, uh, accidental acetaminophen overdose is a common cause for Very hepatitis yep. in this country. Again, an inflammation of the liver, but in this case, due to acetaminophen. And unfortunately, we've seen patients come in and the anecdote doesn't help them and they need to be evaluated for an emergent liver transplant. So even though a medicine is over the counter or available without a prescription and supplements, as well, it doesn't mean that they're safe. You still have to be careful when Absolutely. taking them. And there's a long-term effect if you're using them day in and day out versus occasionally. Right, I, they're all meant for the occasional use. Right. If you have that much pain that you're taking it daily, you should talk to your physician about alternatives. Right. Okay, so, gallbladder. So the gallbladder gives the GI tract a bad name because it's often the source of a lot of misery. Uh, gallbladder surgery is the most common surgery in this country with over a million gallbladders removed every year in the United States. Did not know that. That's a lot of gallbladders, Bob. And so gallstones are usually the cause of gallbladder disease. Gall stones are very common, and we're not really quite sure why some people are prone to gall stones. Seafood? Mm, it's usually seen in patients. My dad, who was a gastroenterologist, used to tell me that they were the patients who were character characterized by the five Fs. Typically female, in their 40s, who are a little overweight, he used to use a different word for overweight, um, who are fertile, so it's premenopausal woman, and gassy, or the other, the other word for that would be, you know, farty. So women tend to have more gallbladder issues than men, and they're usually premenopausal uh, pre women. But gallstones can be seen in men as well, and up to 20% of Americans have gallstones. So wow. that's a lot of gallstones, but not everyone with stones needs to have their gallbladder out. And this is where a gastroenterologist helps to sort out those symptoms that are truly related to the gallbladder, or perhaps more related to just an irritable bowel, and you can keep your gallbladder and help manage your symptoms through other ways. All right, a very nasty disease, Crohn's disease. So Crohn's disease is part of the inflammatory bowel diseases that include Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And it is a spectrum of diseases that affects the GI tract and causes inflammation and swelling, which can lead to obstruction, pain, and alterations in the normal function that can be debilitating. In the last 20 years, 
we have made huge progresses in the treatment for Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. And it's been a really exciting field to be a part of since the new medicines are keeping patients out of the hospital and requiring fewer and fewer surgeries. Going back 20 years, a friend of mine had it and he was in Hopkins. And part of his treatment, they gave him bags and bags of cholesterol. You know, as, as, as a treatment. You know, part of, the, uh, uh, part of the complications of Crohn's is such malnutrition. You know, some of the patients I've seen with Crohn's really have lost a lot of weight and they can't absorb their food. So sometimes they require intravenous nutrition through an IV to supplement them, to build them up so that they can go for surgery. But a lot of times those patients need uh, supportive care before they can go for a surgery because they, they're just too weak. Also, he could drink a rum and coke, rum and coke, rum and coke, 12 of them before there was any buzz at all. It was, just, it was very expensive. <laughs> You know, we all have different pain thresholds, uh, different tolerances. I see that every day. And that's what makes the job interesting, you know, that uh, everyone has a different story, a different symptom complex. We're trained to recognize patterns. Uh, so, but you also have to keep in mind the varied variability that we have. And that's why no two days are ever the same at my work. So what percent of the population has um, irritable bowel syndrome? Yeah, so that's one of the most common consults. I'd say it's very common of the population. I'd say between 10 and 20% have chronic GI issues. Now, irritable bowel uh, means abdominal pain associated with a change in your bowel function, whether it be frequent stools or the other extreme, constipation. And we define constipation as if you don't have a bowel movement for more than three days, and diarrhea if you have more than three bowel movements in one day. So it can be either end of that spectrum, but generally these patients don't lose weight, have nighttime symptoms, or have blood in their stool. Uh, when we check their blood work, they are usually not anemic. Um, and irritable bowel does not lead to increased rates of colon cancer, Crohn's disease, or other problems. It's more of a, well, it's been called nervous stomach or spastic colon. We think of it as a collection of disorders, one being motility problems, other being the way we sense pain. And basically, I try and look at patients' diets and try and remove stimulants. The biggest stimulant in our diet that we all consume, the number one drug in this world that we consume is what, Bob? Coffee. Yes, sir. And so if you come- Ha ha, you tried to trick me. I didn't, but you were right on cue. <laughs> if you come to my office and you're complaining of diarrhea, you know the first thing I'm gonna tell you? Do you drink coffee? And if so? Stop. Yes. Um, because patients nowadays, they really want to look at diets. They ask me frequently about probiotics and about fiber supplements. And I think there's a role for each, you know, minimizing caffeine. Dairy is another big trigger for IBS. Uh, uh, artificial sweeteners, another big trigger. Um, fiber supplements are great for digestive health such as Metamucil or Citrusel, and can help these patients stay regular. We're running out of time. Anything else you want to add? Just that if you have problems that persist, that are on your mind, talk to your doctor about them. And if, if you're not getting answers, please reach out to your local gastroenterologist. Uh, we have a huge department here on the North Shore at Leahy uh, in Peabody. Uh, but I know many of the gastroenterologists in Beverly and at Salem, in Boston, around eastern Massachusetts, you can't go wrong. 
So don't sit home and suffer. Contact your doctor for help. Well, thank you very My much pleasure, for coming Bob. by and informing the public. And tell them to get in and see you. Thank you. Well, that ends another edition of Senior Moments. Uh, glad you could listen. Hope you learned something. And have a, have a great day. Ooh, ooh, the New Year's Eve, we did the town. The day we tore the goalposts down. We will have these moments too.